That will be fun, okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here, but other other than that, sit uh, often hinting as my father would say on your ass. Hey, Shep, are we good to go? Okay, uh, let's get started. Others may come in, and that's good. Uh, welcome to Covering Recovery, Finding News in the Aftermath of a Disaster. This is a special lunchtime symposium um, co-sponsored by the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma here at the Journalism School and the... Uh, National Center for Disaster Preparedness, which is a project of the Earth Institute. This is the inaugural event in a new partnership between the National Center on Disaster Preparedness and the DART Center, uh, whose working title is Covering Recovery. Um, this, we hope this is the initial conversation in uh, a series of discussions and colloquia and research and tips and tools and all kinds of stuff that will go on for a long period of time. Um, for those of you who don't know me and for anyone watching on video, I'm Bruce Shapiro. I'm executive director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, a project of Columbia Journalism School, where we are. Um, last night, I was watching the news, and there was footage from uh, Lumberton, North Carolina, uh, a town I know. Hurricane Matthew had roared through over the weekend, and the pictures that I saw were profoundly distressing, and also very good pictures. Uh, <laughs> there was footage of flooded streets. There was footage of uh, hog and chicken farms where the water was rising and if it rises to the level of the waste uh, disposal systems of those agricultural facilities will poison the water for miles around. There was footage from toxic ash dumps where the water was rising which if flooded over will spread poison throughout the region. Um, it was a good report. And it was good, fit it, good footage, the right images, and the reporter involved, I think from NBC, was asking the right questions. But how many cameras, how many reporters will be in Lumberton three months from now? Three months from now, which reporters will be asking what resources the community needs? to continue recovering? Who, how, who will the government be drawing on and community leaders? How will they get their information? How will they decide a year from now what benchmarks for recovery can journalists, whether local or regional or national, use to see how Lumberton is doing? In three years, how will we assess the impact of this devastating flood just this past weekend? How will we measure the progress? How will we account 
for where money went, where it should have gone? How will we account for the lives of individuals, of families, of children, and of the entire community? That's what this event today is designed to ask. That's what this new project that we're embarking on together um, is designed to ask. Um, my colleague, Erwin Redliner, who's the uh, director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, came to us with this idea. And it was a case of immediate, uh, being immediately in sync. We uh, all agree that whether it's three months later or four years later, as it is now nearly four years since Superstorm Sandy hit New York, we agree that reporters need to do a better job of covering the long-term aftermath. We're very good at rushing out when Superstorm Sandy hits New York. We're pretty good at getting pictures of a devastated neighborhood. We're not always so good not always so imaginative and not always so dedicated when it comes to tracking long-term aftermath. Um, we don't always know who the sources are. We don't know who the right experts are. We don't know where in a community to look for evidence of success or failure. We don't know who the vulnerable populations are. So this project that we're embarked on is set up and today's conversation is set up to ask some of those questions. Um, we agreed early on that this initiative, Covering Recovery, really requires two ongoing conversations. One is between journalists and experts, interdisciplinary experts, scholars, researchers, policy leaders, people from medicine, people from engineering, people from politics, who are part of the hidden decision-making process around disaster recovery and part of the accountability mechanism to the extent that there is one. And there's also a part of the conversation that's journalist to journalist. In this country since September 11th, since Hurricane Katrina, over the last 15 years, there have been a lot of important innovations in reporting. Some of them are technological and we spend a lot of time talking, those, talking about those, but when it comes to aftermath reporting, disaster reporting, we also, need to have a conversation about innovations in sourcing, innovations in structure of beats, innovations in narrative. How do we make these stories real and vivid? Not just how do we dig them out, but how do we make them real and vivid? That's part of the conversation too. Uh, so today's conversation, finding news in the aftermath of disaster, reflects that agenda. Um, we are lucky as we proceed on this issue of core importance to society, to have three fabulous panelists here. And I'm gonna kind of get out of the way and just, just do a little bit of traffic cop with them. But let me introduce all of them here before we start. First of all, on my immediate right, your left, is my colleague Erwin Redliner, MD. Uh, you've got full bios in the back, but I'll just say a brief line about each of them for the sake of video. Uh, Erwin is the director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness based at the Earth Institute here at Columbia, which works to understand and improve the nation's capacity to prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters. Uh, his book, Americans at Risk, Why We Are Not Prepared for Mega Disasters, uh, is really a great handbook and a roadmap for any of you covering disaster issues. I would urge you to go to Amazon or to the bookstore next door and, and, and pick up a copy. Uh, next to him, David Chen is an investigative reporter on the Metro Desk at the New York Times. Uh, if you've been reading the Times lately, you've seen his work on City University of New York, but he, uh, he was a great imaginative digger on the uh, aftermath of Hurricane Sandy on reconstruction and its failures. Uh, as well as on the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund. So he brings years of, of uh, rooting around in the aftermath of catastrophe. And uh, all the way on uh, my right, your left, is uh, my friend Eve Tro, who is the news director at WWN, WWNO in New Orleans, New Orleans Public Radio, where she assigns and edits the station's coverage of New Orleans and Southeast Louisiana including a coastal desk, 
and including education reporting, two issues that are intimately tied up with uh, disaster aftermath. Uh, as she'll discuss, she's, of course, covered the long aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, now 11 years ago, and much more recently, the, the, this year's devastating uh, storm and flooding in western Louisiana, bringing disaster to a different region of the state with a different kind of impact. Um, again, thank you for being here. Um, this issue is of core importance to democratic society, and I should also say it's of core importance to the DART Foundation, which generally, g generously funds the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. They're very involved in disaster aftermath issues, so this is close to our funder's heart. Um, what we'll do is I, I'm, I'm first going to ask Irwin to lay out a little bit how he sees the issues in covering recovery from his sort of expert's point of view. And then we'll, we'll go to David, uh, who will talk about his kind of New York and Sandy stuff. And then Eve, who in some ways has the longest, this combination of recent disaster and long-term disaster echoing back and forth in her coverage and in the community she writes about. So we'll talk, each of them will talk for maybe 10 minutes or so, then we'll have plenty of time for conversation among and, and with all of you. Okay, so Erwin, take it from here. Well, thanks, Bruce. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, something we've been hoping to organize for quite some time. and. Uh, Fortunately, had a chance to uh, meet with Bruce and his team, and uh, we are very excited to, to uh, pursue this initiation of a conversation that's, that hopefully will take place over a longer period of time. But this is kind of the kickoff event. The National Center for Disaster Preparedness, which we started here at Columbia in 2003, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, was set up originally as a way of trying to understand the issues which are involved in the prevention of or mitigation of or response to or recovery from disasters. But from day one, we were interested in how our work as kind of an academic think tank would actually influence the public and, uh, and elected officials and policymakers. We didn't want to be an academic institution in a vacuum, uh, you know, toiling away at developing data that may or may not have any uh, direct impact on how people think and what they do and how they set priorities. So this whole idea of the interface between the work that we do and the influencing of public policy and the public in general is impossible without the intermediary of the media, of the press. So a critical role and an absolutely essential link uh, is, in our view, uh, essential to making a difference so that we don't keep repeating the mistakes of the past and we do continue to advance uh, what we think is are better policies with better outcomes, et cetera. And by the way, what I'm going to talk about would apply to almost any issue you could think of. And why you see this tree falling in the forest is if no one's around to hear it, then no one hears it. <laughs> so the role of the media is to make sure that the trees that are falling, that the sound, the crashing sound, is resonating with elected officials and policymakers. That's, that's your job. You're the, you're the world's microphone. And uh, we, we just want to emphasize how critical that is as we sort of get into this notion of, of covering disasters in general and covering recovery in particular. I, I put this up there because if you want to reach me, that's my email. And feel free at any point now or later to, uh, to do that. <coughs> uh, and let me just quickly add, we will, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. You should put your email on that if you want to get emails from the DART Center. And we will also uh, circulate to anyone who wants the email contacts of folks who are here. So indicate that, okay? So I'm going to go over um, five uh, points relative to uh, covering disasters generally. And they are recovery, money, lessons, and spinning, and tracking. And um, they're gonna go, I'm going to go through these very quickly, mindful of the time frame that, uh, uh, that, is, that Bruce has outlined. So I'm going to start actually with tracking. So I'm going to show you some new data that we've been putting together at the National Center. And much of this work is uh, credited to Jonathan Surrey. Where are you, Jonathan? Back here, who's uh, one of our researchers at the center and who's helped me manifest visually what one of the points I would like to make here. So what we're going to look at are a couple of graphs. I don't know if you, 
if, if you can see this. So what we're dealing with here uh, in the case of terrorism coverage, so these are just some preliminary marks to get, to get the ball rolling here. And what we're looking at is um, uh, a, a graph that's showing the public searching the web here for a particular topic, and that's in blue, uh, just to get information. Secondly is the public searching of news media to find out exactly what is happening. And the third from Factiva are the actual articles being published. So we're tracking these uh, three trends and seeing how they relate to one another. So what we have here is between August 2nd, 2015 and the end of July this year, we see several events that we chose explicitly to see how these, what the relationship, relationships are among these different kinds of uh, searches and, and outcomes. So what we see here in this one is a pretty good tracking that shows the public interest in this topic and the media attention are tracking pretty much together. They're pretty simultaneously engaged and you see where there's an event, there's a lot of coverage and there's a lot of interest. Interest, by the way, in the public, just to emphasize this, both in looking, about, uh, looking into the topic and looking into the coverage of the issue. Here's another one, which was, this is the Flint story and media, where uh, no one obviously thought about lead in the uh, water supply of this impoverished city of uh, where 100,000 uh, children and their families lived uh, until it was discovered through a variety of things that we won't go into, but it was discovered that there were extraordinarily high levels of lead in the drinking water in Flint. Uh, that story was revealed uh, after some work by a researcher from Virginia Tech and uh, a, a very proactive pediatrician dealing with uh, children in that community. There was coverage. There was a lot of interest. So if you look, if you follow me with the, uh, with the actual news stories here, you see they continued uh, through various uh, episodes in this saga here. But although there was a peak of interest by the public in both looking up what is, what is the problem with lead in the water and how much coverage it's getting, the public interest diminishes even though the press was continuing to cover. Now, uh, a couple of big things happened. First of all, there was a lot of initial attention in December, uh, but uh, in last December, and a lot of that attention was focused by Rachel Maddow of MSNBC, and that had a big spike in, in general interest by the public and the press. Uh, and then, uh, there were another few spikes that had to do with other things, like criminal charges being filed against certain public officials. But all the, all the while that the press coverage was uh, continuing to roll along here, the public interest was diminishing. Why was it diminishing? I don't know. This is a small Midwest town comprised mostly of African Americans, uh, and, you know, it's not my community and sort of whatever is how we're interpreting it. That's probably it a very biased way of interpreting it, but that's one way of looking at what would explain the divergence of public interest and media coverage. But if we just track the, the simultaneous curves here, it's just an interesting thing, to, interesting thing to follow. So this shows public interest tracking, at first the, the press, but then uh, public interest waning, although the media keeps, keeps following it as the stories evolve. Zika. So here's another interesting uh, example of, of the relationship between uh, public interest and media coverage. So we see here a lot of coverage that happened when WHO declared Zika a public health concern. Uh, and the first reported cases in the U.S. caused a lot of interest in the media and in the public's mind. Uh, here we have a divergence of people. This is, again, this is the green, the green line here are, uh, are the actual articles in orange is, are the news searches by the general public. So the general public is interested in following the coverage of the Zika story, but the, there's a drop off in people just looking up Zika to see what it is. People figured out what Zika is, and now what they want to know is, is Zika going to be a problem when we take our vacation in Puerto Rico? So they're following, they're tracking the news about Zika uh, without necessarily being, uh, needing more information about what Zika is about. Just another interesting pattern. Um, let me just go on here. And, okay, the, this is the last thing I want to show you, which has to do with this Baton Rouge uh, flooding that, uh, that uh, was just mentioned by Bruce. So what happened here was that there was a very significant storm, uh, but followed by much more significant amount of flooding that left 
thousands and thousands of people and families uh, with wrecked homes and wrecked communities and all sorts of uh, major issues here. We believe what preceded this, by the way, and we don't have the data, which is why it's not really on the slide here, and John and I are going to be looking into this, but we think there was a rush of social media that was occurring here that actually prompted the coverage and the concern that people had nationally about what was going on there. And in this particular pattern, uh, we saw, let's say, let's say we're correct that the initial coverage was driven by the extent of the storm and also uh, a lot of uh, activity in the social media. And secondly, there are two uh, peaks here uh, that involved political visits. So uh, Donald Trump visited Baton Rouge and President Obama visited Baton Rouge. The coverage of those events was not about the flooding and the situation related to the community, but it was about the political issues involving those two people who came there for reasons that were uh, maybe, I, I don't know, were some of them more political than substantive? I, I just don't want to interpret that. But what you can see here is that limited amount of coverage that was mostly political and a waning of, uh, of uh, public interest outside of Baton Rouge about what was going on there. So this is public interest outpacing media interest at the onset and media attention surging uh, for those presidential uh, visits or those political visits while, uh, while public interest was subsiding. So that was one thing. And I, I just want to put that aside for the moment, but I think this is something we need to come back to because when we're talking about what's being covered from a recovery point of view, uh, we'll have other things that we want to talk about. The second thing is the lessons learned. What did we learn from the recovery of, uh, uh, of Superstorm Sandy or of 9-11 uh, or of uh, um, Katrina, for example? So in every disaster, we have the experience. The disaster happens, a big mega event with lots and lots of uh, casualties and fatalities, and it is an experience that the country, that the country um, shares in but the people who are in the place where the disaster occurs are actually uh, impacted strongly. After every single major disaster, there is something called a lessons learned meeting. It may be called a hot wash or other names, but where all the officials gather together and the agencies and they say, what happened, what did we do? What is the lesson we've learned from how we handle, say, Superstorm Sandy? And the problem is, do those lessons learned or observed or written about actually get applied. And this is something that journalists, in my opinion, really need to pay attention to and make sure that we go from uh, what usually happens is the, from the experience we describe the lesson, but what hardly ever happens is that those lessons uh, get actually applied so that the next time we're doing something different. And over and over again, we see recurrent uh, challenges that are not met because we observed the lessons and didn't apply them. Who's the watchdog? to make sure that we go that final step, uh, that's you. Uh, it's sort of us and it's you, but it's you. Um, and if you're not holding uh, people accountable for making sure that we're not repeating the same things over and over again, I think that's gonna be a problem for the country. So while every disaster, of, uh, a large disaster, is called a wake-up call, we think it's more like snooze alarms, <laughs> where you know, we, get, we get aroused by the thing and it's dramatic and it's you know, CNN reporters in hip boots and, you know, waiting around in the one puddle they could find. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we hit that snooze button and we drift back off to some state of complacency, which is a bad thing. I just wanted to point out that we're watching. Uh, the third uh, issue I just want to mention here is something that I'm referring to as the denominator problem, wherein you all in the media, as well as senior public officials, elected officials, get spun. And here's how you get spun. Because we don't understand this dynamic, which is that what's actually needed to solve a problem or to get ready for a disaster has a relationship that's not understood in terms of what's actually being done. So when we were preparing for pandemics very intensely in the mid-2000s, 2006, 7, 8, uh, and uh, the then health, the uh, governor of New York, who was Taki at the time, said, we're really prepared for pandemics, and he brought up his uh, health commissioner, and she said, yeah, we have a million uh, N95 face masks in storage ready for a pandemic. And it was touted as a really major accomplishment, except we needed 100 million face masks 
to be stored, stockpiled, because you have to change them every four hours. It's a, it's a massive undertaking. So not knowing what is actually needed, and you're just reporting on, well, that's a big number with a lot of zeros. Uh, we want you to understand what is actually needed so that you can judge the information that you're getting from the public official. And by the way, that public official spun the governor who bought the story that they're prepared with, and this is a tiny example, and it was bought by the media. And it was not bought by the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, I might add. <laughs> so this is how this looks. So at the starting line, let's say we have zero preparedness for a particular kind of disaster or a particular recovery, right? And at the end of this, where the green arrow is, we're 100% prepared. We're prepared so much that there are no flaws and everything's going to go smooth and we'll be recovered in three days. So in between those two extremes are the, the real world. So first of all, it's the current state of things. So let's say we have made progress from here to here, uh, and we're not going to get here, but we would like to get here. So when it's being reported by a public official, let's say in a state of readiness, the question is, are we doing fine because of this delta, or are we way behind because of this delta? Do, do, you see what I'm saying here? That's, that is up to you to judge, and us to judge, but uh, that judgment rarely gets made. Or if it gets made, it gets made randomly. But in order to make that judgment, journalists have to understand what is actually needed, and does this make sense? Is this a celebratory thing, or is this a holy crap, we're, we're, we're in trouble here? Uh, we need you. So here's uh, the story about recovery. This is Sandy with massive flooding in the Northeast. It was called a superstorm, and et cetera, et cetera, and you're all very aware of this. So what happened, and I, there's much that happened, but I'm just going to tell you one quick thing. The way recovery should be for families that have actually experienced the impact of a disaster like that is they should be able to go to some sort of central coordinator who can help them in their moment of grief and shock sort out what assets might be available to them from local NGOs, from voluntary organizations, from federal government, from the state, from non nonprofits, from their insurance company, from their banks, what's going to happen with their mortgage, how are they going to rebuild. Uh, the government said, now you've got to put your house on stilts. It's $75,000. Who's going to pay for that, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of the family being able to go and visit with the central coordinator who will help them understand what's available, what we actually have and have had forever is we put the, the family in crisis in the center of all this horrible bureaucracy at their worst moments in their lives where they're, they're grieving, they've had loss, they're traumatized, they don't know where their next paycheck's going to come from, and they become the case manager for their own situation, trying to sort out this bureaucratic nightmare that surrounds them. And this is a problem. We've been talking about this since uh, Katrina. Uh, but it would be great if uh, journalists were focused on this issue, which is what exactly has happened that makes the recovery experience different for human beings, uh, different now than it was you know, uh, more than a decade ago in, uh, in New Orleans. So, and the last, next to last point I'm going to make is this issue about the money and following the money. And uh, I can't emphasize this enough. So 18 and a half, I mean 47.9 billion dollars, 48 billion essentially, uh, dollars was appropriated by the federal government for uh, recovery from Sandy. That money was distributed among all of these agencies. Some of them got a tiny amount and some of them got more. So every one of these federal agencies listed here uh, got some share of that $48 billion. Then that money was eventually streamed down into the state counterparts of all of these same agencies. So the Federal Health and Human Services went to New York State's uh, Department of Health, for example. And then it went from there to local agencies of government. So it went from the Congress, who appropriated the money, to the federal agencies, to the state agencies, to the local agencies. Where the hell is that money? I defy anyone to tell me right now how that money was used. Was it used effectively? Was it used efficiently? Who exactly is accountable for it? and uh, who is tracking what has happened, because that's all related to the previous slides I showed you about the kind of help people get or don't get. Uh, and there's no entity, there's no sector in our society other than journalists who can really track the money in a way that is objective and allows us to understand what has happened, and then writes about it, and writes about it, and writes about it, or reports on it, so that changes can be made the next time. 
So when, when and if Louisiana gets the $2.8 billion that it wants to recover from this flooding, who is tracking that? And I'm hoping that's a lot of you. So I'm going to just uh, stop at that, and uh, hopefully this will stimulate some questions. And uh, uh, when we get to the end of the presentations, we'll happy to talk. Thank you, Erwin. So David, take us where we need to go. Move from expert testimony to a journalist's efforts to keep up with all of this. Uh, I guess what I would say is uh, that was a terrific presentation for starters, and um, you know, obviously. Uh, you know, everyone is a lot more prepared uh, than uh, any of us, frankly. Well, you know, but they're, they're, they're sort of a, um, I feel like that applies to a lot of the way that uh, we generally try to cover things, right? I mean, journalists are generalists, and we sort of uh, obviously have, there are fewer, um, you know, in our ranks. Uh, we're getting paid even less, I suppose, uh, there, and, and the demands are greater in terms of, uh, you know, tweeting this or or, you know, Facebook living that or doing all these different things. So we just have even less time to prepare for almost anything. And, and when I was thinking about um, this uh, panel uh, today, I thought about how, um, you know, uh, if, if we talk about not, not the 9-11 stuff, but really post-Sandy, how, uh, you know, how ill-prepared uh, I really was to, to do much of anything and how a lot of the coverage is frankly um, often, you know, very well-meaning but haphazard and depending on who's available and, you know, uh, who can actually rent a car or who can actually go somewhere, go get out to the Rockaways without getting lost or whatever. So these are all little things that never show up in any kind of uh, story per se. But, you know, the way that um, I thought uh, would be uh, probably easiest for me to explain uh, uh, without getting too bogged down in all the, you know, bureaucratic language that I uh, have a tendency to sink myself into is to just do it fairly chronologically in terms of my general lack of prepa preparation to, in terms of post-Sandy recovery and then just kind of, uh, you know, how we were uh, kind of flailing about, frankly, in terms of trying to cover things and, 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 and uh, you know, provide, um, you know, a thorough and, 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 um, and, and enlightening uh, coverage, I guess. I mean, I... Uh, you know, I, I guess I can start in a way by saying that this, this storm, uh, the Superstorm Sandy, certainly affected me on a personal level because um, I lost power for a week. I live in New Jersey. I live in Montclair, where a lot of journalists live. And um, there, uh, you know, so we, uh, uh, I, I had a very hard time getting around and there was, you know, all the gas stations were closed or whatever. And, and it was very difficult. And by the time that I um, was able to... Um, uh, help out with some coverage and 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 borrow a car. I went down to um, uh, to the Jersey Shore to uh, um, uh, near Brick Township, if anyone is familiar with that area. And I just was just stunned at the devastation. I just had no idea of. And I've seen you know I've seen different things. Obviously you know I'd covered uh, the aftermath of 9/11, but this was a totally different thing in terms of seeing it along the coast, where you have all these different. You know, someone's pool is in someone else's yard or whatever, or, or all these different, all the debris that was all over the place. And it was just, you know, I just didn't know what to say. And I was trying to type these things. And then later, when I thought about it, I was trying to tell my, um, my wife and my kids about it. I realized that I didn't take any pictures or whatever. I didn't tweet a picture out, which I would probably do now automatically. And it made me think about how um, I really wanted to go back and sort of find out more about the, the, the family that lost you know, the, all these different things or the toys that I saw strewn about, you know, uh, you know in, in different uh, streams and, 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 um, and uh, you know, all this insulation, like fiberglass insulation that was like floating all over the place and stuff. And I just, I, I just thought about how I really wanted to go back and, try, and, and do some things. And in a way, I think the idea of, of just trying to go back is a, maybe a helpful theme that, um, you know, in retrospect, certainly without any planning, you know, maybe is is what kind of uh, you know drove me to pursue the kinds of stories that I did from that point on. I mean, it was not uh, just to um, um, uh, back up even more. I mean, not long after that, I but at that time I should say I was um, the city hall bureau chief for the Times, and so um, I was uh, down um, in uh, a city hall and covering Mayor Bloomberg at the time. Uh, this is his last term. And um, one of the, uh, one of the, you know, probably this is like in uh, November or December of 2012, I think he uh, uh, had a big, big speech um, 
downtown, I think it was at a place that had been devastated by uh, the storm, uh, you know, which he announced his uh, uh, first comprehensive plan uh, to, um, uh, to rebuild and what the city would do going forward in terms of resiliency efforts and all these different things. And I remember it was a very big deal because he had a surprise guest who turned out to be Al Gore. It was like, a, there were, I mean, it was like a state of the city or a state of the union production, really incredible values because, you know, that's what he can do. And, um, uh, and it was very impressive. A lot of uh, environmentalists, a lot of urban planners, a lot of, and I don't know if you guys were there for that, but, you know, that was a, a lot of people thought that was a really impressive display of commitment and a real sort of um, uh, vision for the future, I guess. Now, if you, if you fast forward a bit, uh, and we can skip over the, uh, basically most of the 2013 year, because uh, I was consumed with covering the, um, the uh, now tame by comparison race for mayor of New York City, I guess. Um, the, you know, the, the, after, after uh, uh, um, uh, Bill de Blasio became mayor, uh, we wanted, we were, what I was, I was still hearing um, uh, from different uh, folks who had, you know, either been to the Bloomberg announcement or had uh, worked on different programs trying to implement certain aspects of that about problems with the recovery, even though it was a year or two afterwards, right? And, and most, most of the press had very much moved on other than the obligatory, you know, one year anniversary or two year anniversary story where you go to you know, uh, you go to Staten Island, you interview some people who look, uh, you know, really bereaved or whatever, and then that's your story, right? So we, you know, we're hearing about all this complicated stuff that generally turns a lot of journalists off in terms of, you know, application process, filling out forms, you know, uh, computer uh, uh, failures, and, you know, this is not the sexiest kind of stuff that will really make a lot of uh, newscasts or newspaper stories, you know, but you know, as we were just, I think, I just kept on thinking, well, maybe, maybe I'm giving myself too much credit now, but I mean, I was thinking about how, um, uh, you know, it was important to just try to uh, remember um, the plight of the people who were affected in the first place and how they've been carrying a lot of difficulties with them, you know, every moment since, I guess. And so, you know, we, uh, I mean, uh, probably a, a, the younger reporter in me would have um, sort of blown them off and ignored them because it was too difficult or complicated or bureaucratic, and that was not very exciting, right? But I, you know, you, you, after a while, you just kind of uh, learn to listen more and you appreciate these different stories. And then slowly we began to realize that the big pr uh, um, promises that the, the mayor had made uh, and that de Blasio had promised to carry out were just not really being met. There are all these uh, numbers that are thrown out in terms of the, the denominators, in terms of we're going to rebuild, you know, what I forget the, what the number is now, you know, 10,000 houses and we're going to commit all this money and, you know, isn't this great? And when you actually looked at the number of permits, which was buried somewhere, it was like, I don't know, a couple hundred that I have housing, houses that actually started to be rebuilt, which was, you know, a year, two years out was shockingly low. So what we decided to do was and I did this with a colleague who's much better at, um, navig Russ Butner, uh, who's much better at navigating this stuff, uh, very arcane things. He's one of the people, by the way, who um, was uh, involved in um, reporting on Trump's taxes and his Atlantic City adventures, I guess. So he is, he is not to be messed with. Uh, and uh, so we began to try to understand this pr uh, program called Build It Back, which was the, the, uh, the, the Bloomberg uh, program to, um, to rebuild things, and then we were talking to, I think the way that, what I learned from Russ was you, you, you sort of, you, you, uh, you build out a timeline in terms of what happened, and you try to figure out the different people who were involved at various stages of the process, and this sort of overlaps a lot with what Erwin said here, and, and we began to realize that, um, and you also have to understand, the, understand or have patience with the design of the program, which is, again, not sexy at all. It's, you know, it's like engineering or something like that, but, you know, we began to realize that there were a lot of um, uh, problems with every single step of the, the uh, recovery process for the average person who had been affected. And we began to sort of diagram, it. I mean, I, I remember doing this sort of a, like a flow chart, whatever, and realized that there were all these bottlenecks very, very early on in the design of the process, you know, that just sort of bollocks the whole thing up. And then so we were finally able to, um, uh, to try to explain it in this kind of, you know, flow chart kind of way in terms of why this program was so frustrating to so many people and not much was getting 
done, and we took a step back to under and 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 realized that it was uh, it was like a flawed design, uh, you know, from the, the the very beginning, where the administration had relied Bloomberg now had relied overly on uh, consultants, and and maybe you guys have uh, friends or have worked at Boston Consulting Group, so no offense to them, but they really. Um, were uh, they they had designed this incredibly um, technical thing that was on paper looked great and uh, but really um, slowed a lot of things down in terms of requiring way too many things like 30 pieces of documentation when people had no evidence and the other thing that um, I'm sure Eve's going to pick up on is that I, I, I we kept on hearing whoops, excuse me kept on hearing about uh, the Katrina effect or the hangover effect you know sort of being uh, imbued in a lot of the discussions as, uh, as in terms of you when know, we were interviewing different Bloomberg folks in terms of Katrina, Katrina, Katrina. Because, you know, as it turns out, they were trying to do everything. They were trying to be the anti-Katrina, basically, when it came to designing programs. They thought that there was way too much, uh, it, was, it was way too easy for uh, homeowners to pick their own contractors and, uh, in Louisiana, and that's what sort of led to a lot of the fraud. They thought it was also just the insurance, and I'll get to this later, but the insurance uh, companies were way too generous, and so that led to just overpayments and, and that kind of stuff. So that, that mentality uh, really helped to define the, the, the rigid uh, nature of this, of this program that they designed. And so that, I thought, was um, a useful uh, public service because we sort of explained how the process really got bogged down and then they tried to, and then the Blasio, you know, claimed that he was shocked or whatever, and then he uh, uh, tried to appoint some new people and tried to do some some things and and, and to improve, uh, you know, uh, uh, the process, I guess. Now uh, you f you fast forward again, and then we um, uh, kept on hearing about additional problems w with that, which was, uh, you know, which we we also uh, covered again. It's the idea of going back and 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 always revisiting things. I mean, we don't do this that well, but I mean, occasionally we will do do that and and um and at the same time um i was beginning to uh hear of a lot of uh concerns about the uh the flood insurance uh, uh uh process which i'm sure you also know a lot about and and that was um and again this is one of these things where you know the younger person in me would have blown it off because i i don't know anything about insurance i you know i i don't understand it i let my wife take care of it so i don't under i don't know how these deductibles or other kinds of things work, and it's not again totally not sexy where you're trying to deal with the, uh, you know Allstate or other other kinds of things. I, I and and but but people kept on um, uh, calling us or saying hey, you have to look at this F FEMA, you have to look at insurance. There was even a group that started in New Jersey called Stop FEMA Now, which um, you know I thought initially was like a political group, but really it was just a bunch of different folks uh, from some of the areas that I had visited during that initial sort of harrowing drive down the shore. And um, again, I think there was just this respect for, uh, uh, you know, uh, their experiences and just kind of um, a sort of, uh, that, that I, I, I think helped to um, make me a little less, um, uh, you know, prone to like blowing that off, I guess, right? So, so as I was hearing more and more of these stories about, uh, you know, in problems with insurance, I guess what, what we had, what I uh, came to realize was that um, you know, a lot of people thought that they were getting lowballed in terms of insurance payments, and they didn't know why. And then all of a sudden, there was uh, someone had had sued a company in Long Island, saying that 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 an engineering company that had been hired by an uh, it's, it's too complicated, but hired by an like a, an insurance company basically had um, doctored this engineering report to give the appearance that you know, that uh, the damage was not caused by the storm, but instead was caused by, you know, I don't know, Long Island weather or something like that. So it was just, and, and, the, and they, were, they thought it was just ridiculous. And then somebody by accident happened to, um, when they asked their, uh, I guess a claims adjuster or an engineer um, about why they were uh, giving them such a, uh, like no money in terms of their insurance claim, the guy said, oh, here's, here's a draft of my report. And so she took a screenshot of it, which is something you couldn't have done several years ago, and then she compared it to her the final report, which was completely different. The final report was the one that had lowballed or basically lowballed her claim and dismissed it. The original one that this guy submitted actually said that yes, it was the storm that caused all this damage, and she really should put in for all this stuff. So that all of a sudden, you know, uh, you know, ventured into the realm of potential fraud. And so 
you know, we began to, and this was, uh, you know, with all, uh, it, it was very difficult work to try to piece together, you know, other potential cases of, of uh, you know, um, uh, instances in which uh, engineers or others, adjusters might have um, either uh, doctored it or been in on it or something like that. And, you know, even though it was never totally um, established that there was a, you know, this magic memo from, you know, all states down to the insurance, to the adjusters and the engineers that you must do this, um, th there was still, uh, an, an, there were still enough uh, examples out there to suggest that there was kind of this tendency on the part of a lot of engineers to kind of fudge their reports in order to lowball the claims and stuff like that. And so we uh, wrote about it and then um, 60 Minutes also did uh, a, a story about it after, after ours ran and that was the kind of thing, and, and you know, ours and also TV, there's nothing like TV in terms of getting members of Congress really up in arms, you know. So <laughs> after that, then uh, FEMA sort of was on the defensive and they, prompt, they reopened the entire insurance claims process. So, um, and they, they said, we're gonna look at this, this is, uh, this is irregular, this is an abomination, and we, you know, people shouldn't be denied, we're gonna extend the deadline for you to apply, we're gonna look at all the claims, all 100,000 or whatever it is claims, you know, up and down the, uh, the East Coast, and so they, they did that. But then you fast forward again, and this is again going about going back, you know, the, about a year, a year later, FEMA says, oh, this is great, you know, we uh, got a lot of people to reapply, everything's going well, and, and we're still hearing about problems, you know, from different people, um, and, um, and you, you should never, uh, I mean, uh, you sort of automatically shut off uh, potential sources, because one of the main sources who came to me was this guy who I, have known uh, for years uh, through a political context, who was like a, who was like a, a you know, a big uh, advocate uh, for Trump, and is known for being sort of a like a, you know, a, like a Roger. I don't know if you guys know Roger Stone, but like a Roger Stone sort of um, disciple, if you will, or compatriot. And again, you know, very colorful. But he was representing um, a, a law firm uh, and had heard a lot of stories about people really. Um, just getting no love at all from FEMA, just being so frustrated. So it just, again, it's the kind of thing where you, because you know the people's experiences, you, you check it out because this is sort of what you're obligated to do if you have the time. So we discovered that, there, sure enough, there were additional, there were a lot of problems with this reopened FEMA process, which was designed to fix the initial process. And um, we wrote about, uh, so I, I, I found a, a number of people who had all these ridiculous, uh, situations in which, again, the, paper, the bureaucracy and uh, X number of pieces of documentation, all this other stuff was just really uh, adding up, I guess. And, um, you know, so that, that also prompted FEMA to revise its policy again to kind of try to do something, I guess. Um, but, um, you know, if you, if you fast forward uh, yet again, I, I'm, even though I'm not really doing a lot of uh, disaster recovery uh, things anymore, um, it's still something, I mean, a lot of those people still reach out and I still try to listen and I try to see if there are other things that can be done because you really never know when it comes to that. And I, I think that long timeline is one of the key takeaways from your work, that you are building and developing sources over an arc of several years here that creates this really important coverage. So Eve, you are, you have this sort of dual challenge of reporting in the present tense on a new disaster and in the present tense on recovery efforts from Katrina and keeping people's attention mm -hmm. to a story that they must be both fascinated by and fatigued by and all sorts of stuff. Why don't you give us an overview here? Sure. Um, well, as with David, I was woefully unprepared when Katrina hit. I was living in New Orleans at the time. Uh, I was 26. I was working on an arts and culture national program. I, I don't think I'd ever even been to a city council meeting or a school board meeting or, or anything like that. If this really just happened to the place that I lived in and, and loved. Um, and I became kind of the go-to stringer for national public radio. Uh, I was working for a radio program. So I did, I did have field recording gear. I did have audio editing skills. I did have reporting skills, uh, but you know, I was not ready to really cover this, but I wanted to because it's where I lived and I saw what was happening and I needed to figure out how to do this. And um, you know, I, and I stuck with it for about two years. I did a, a ton of features on a wide variety of things from housing to healthcare to education. 
as Bruce mentioned, you know, there were a lot of students who were just not in school for months and months after Katrina. And I totally burned out after about two years, and I, and I left New Orleans, which was honestly the, the first person essay I did about deciding to leave this city in, in the midst of its flailing recovery was the story I did that got the most attention. So it was a, a first person essay just about how hard it was to, to break up with New Orleans when it was like really still on its knees and didn't seem like it was gonna be getting better anytime soon. Um, but fast forward to 2013, I had been, so I went to Los Angeles and I worked for a radio show called Marketplace. Um, and I did cover a lot. I was like the go-to hurricane person at Marketplace, <laughs> sort of. Anytime there was a disaster that came up, it's like, oh, ask Eve about, oh, you, you should really talk to Eve Tro about that. Like, I was just sort of the go-to person. Um, and I remember when Isaac, I mean, we have so many name storms now. Isaac was 2012, um, came to New Orleans, and the levy system had just been, like, officially completed. The $14 billion federal levy system had just been completed. And I walk in, and on the whiteboard uh, for the day's editorial meeting is Isaac, New Orleans, uh, dash, even worth it, question mark? And I was just like, what? This question about whether New Orleans deserves to exist or not, like, this is still a question. Seven years after Katrina, there's just this question that just would not go away. And what it really spoke to for me was how little empathy had been generated since Katrina. It was really like, well, who would live uh, below sea level? And why do all those people, and you can interpret it that however you want, decide to live there anyway? And isn't that just a bad idea? And I think that happens a lot with trauma just naturally, that um, people want to push it away. Like, here's why that happened to those people, and here's why it would not happen to me, because I have made reasonable choices. You know, I um, have a college degree and live a very normal middle-class life and live in a place without any disasters. Um, and, you know, the argument after Katrina, really until Sandy, I don't think it ever stuck that, no, this can happen anywhere and does happen all the time. Tornadoes, flooding. I grew up in rural Missouri in a town that flooded constantly, so... Maybe I just had that in my brain that like, that, this really can happen anywhere and, and any kind of thing can happen. Even you wanna take it to um, mass shootings in public places. I mean, this idea of disaster encompasses so much and yet there's such an abhorrence to it that we, we wanna try to push it away. And I think that impedes preparedness as well. It's not fun to think about this stuff. Um, it's not sexy. Um, the, the warehouse of, of face masks seems like kind of a waste. Like, can't we like do something else with this money besides buy 100 million face masks? <laughs> but so, so um, I wanted to talk some about what's happened since then. So I moved back to New Orleans in 2013 to start a local newsroom at WWNO, uh, the NPR station in New Orleans. It had been a classical music station. And even in 2013, I knew that the anniversary of Katrina was gonna come up. Like, it was two years away, I was already agonizing over it. Like, oh, it's gonna be so terrible, but it's also such an opportunity to revisit some of these themes, to like, really handle some unfinished business. And then as the anniversary, the 10 year mark of Katrina was August 2015, um, started to really get a lot closer, there was already like anticipation of fatigue about it. There are already talks about how, well, we don't want to do too much because, you know, like we just don't, want, I don't know how much people really want to hear about this and what is there really to say? And we just don't want to hear a bunch of like sad people who are still sad because nobody's interested in that. And, and obviously a lot of these systems have not been fixed and so what conversations are there really to be had? Uh, I took that as a, a very specific journalistic challenge and not only did I say we were gonna cover it, but we did a whole show about it. And we created a podcast called Katrina the Debris, which, um, you know, this theme of, of unfinished business, of picking up what was still left behind by the storm. And so we did a weekly episode for 14 weeks, and um, I wanted to play some audio from that. We're a very small newsroom. We have three reporters and myself, and we got some extra funding for a producer for the summer. So there were things we wanted to cover, like the diaspora. I mean, there were so many people who left New Orleans with like, a backpack or a small duffel bag of things, and they literally have never been back. They have never come back. They lost everything they had. They lost their homes. They, their families were completely displaced and dispersed around the country. And people got on airplanes and didn't know where those airplanes were going, and now they just live wherever that airplane landed. And they have never been back to the place where they may have been based for generations as a family. 
um, you know, small newsroom. We can't cover the whole diaspora. We can't, we can't do that. But, okay, Houston. So we narrowed it down to Houston. And what can we do with Houston? We can send someone to Houston. Um, Houston is where so many people wound up. And you, you hear Katrina uttered thousands of times every day in New Orleans still. In, in any normal conversation you have with a New Orleanian, you're likely to hear them talk about like, after Katrina, you know, my brother moved to Houston. Uh, after Katrina, you know, my mom still stays in Houston. So you hear it's, it's ingrained in our conversation and in our society. But there's all this unprocessed stuff about it. Houston took tons of people into the Astrodome. Houston had this uh, initial generous response, and then that generosity quickly we, uh, was, was waning in the sense that there were all these rumors about, oh, all the Katrina evacuees are causing a huge crime wave. Um, and so we wanted to look back at Houston and what really happened. Our producer, Kate Richardson, was a senior in high school in Houston when Katrina hit. So we sent her back to her high school to report on the impact of the so-called Katrina kids who showed up at her high school. And um, this is, uh, and so she went back and she debunked the myth that the Katrina kids were causing fights all the time, uh, what services those students got and didn't get. And let's play two little clips from her. Houston one is the first one right there. At the Astrodome tonight, right now, there are 15,000 people. 11,000 will be put up inside Reliant Center and 3,000 in Reliant Arena. And another 5,000 will find shelter at the George R. Brown Convention Center downtown. Only 350 miles of interstate separate Houston and New Orleans. But culturally, the distance can feel immense. Stasia Davis was a public school teacher in New Orleans East before the flood. You know, this is like a whole new culture to us because at home, you can walk down the street, you don't even have to know the people, they're gonna say hello, they're gonna find out, you know, something about you. Here, it's just like everybody does their own thing for them and, you know, go on. And it's, it's, it's hard to get used to. I've gotten used to it now, but it's, it's hard to get used to. When Katrina hit, she and her family loaded up five cars and made a grueling last minute evacuation to Houston. Stasia and her kids bounced around to different houses those first few months. It was unsettling and she was still grieving the life she had left behind in New Orleans. Uh, sometimes I get angry because I would, had my own house, like I say, doing the best job I could as a teacher. I mean, and just really enjoying my life with my kids and then having to like start all over. That part I don't like, I don't like to talk about it. It's really interesting right there. You can hear her switch tense. She switches into present tense. It's 10 years later. She's saying, I get angry. I don't like to talk about it. And that is a real mark of, of trauma. If, if you talk to trauma counselors, that happens a lot with people who've been through something and are still suffering from it. They, you switch tense. You're, you are, as you describe it, reliving what happened to you. So it's 10 years later. So um, Stacia still lives in Houston, and um, when Kate went back to the school, she talked to some former students and also some former teachers there, and I wanted to just play a little bit more of that, that, that even though, um, so Stacia, like a lot of people, really did find some things to be better about leaving New Orleans, and yet, so then there's a tension that's created between this terrible thing happened, I'm grieving for it, but I have to acknowledge that, that some things are better. So there's sort of like this, this interesting, nuanced narrative that develops that is um, really hard to report on. And I thought that, that a decade later it was sort of worth digging into that a little bit more because I feel like that got really glossed over in some ways that, oh, well, everybody's like better off anyway. That place was terrible. Um, so yeah, it's not quite that simple. So let's play the second clip. At the Astrodome tonight, right now, there are 15,000 people. 11,000 will be put up inside Reliant Center and 3,000 in Reliant Arena. Correctly, sorry about that. Um, well, we'll just have to skip that one, which is fine because the Houston episode is great and you should really listen to the whole thing. <laughs> it's, it's so good. It starts with Chamillionaire. It's so good. It, like, it's a snapshot of Houston in 2005 and what it was like to be a high schooler in 2005. It's so good. Kate did an awesome job on it. Um, in terms of stories, this idea of expectations and lessons learned is really important. And the Road Home program was highly vilified. That was the program that really was meant to help individual homeowners after Katrina. 
Money to help homeowners has to come through HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It's like an incredibly difficult thing to use HUD money to pay people to fix their houses. It's not what it was built for. Um, the system is like, we're still, it, it, was, it was something that was, Katrina prompted a, a system to be put in place, but again, it was sort of ad hoc, um, that never happened before, so then, then figuring out whether it's working or not was challenging. What Road Home did was it awarded people money to fix their homes based on how much the house was worth. Uh, well, in a community like New Orleans and, and many around the US, a home's worth had a lot to do with who could buy a home and when, who was allowed to buy homes in certain areas. It goes back to this idea of redlining, which you may know, that some uh, people of color were not allowed to buy homes in certain areas. And, and if you look at that impact, then those pockets of the city over time, property values did not increase as much as in other areas of the city. So, you know, this is something that goes back to the 50s, the 60s, and 70s. But when Katrina hits, the, the property values are artificially depressed for mostly black New Orleanians. So the award that they're getting is not nearly as much as other families in the area. And the truth of the matter is, if you're looking at fixing your home, it costs the same no matter what. A roof is a roof. It, it doesn't matter what the property value was before. The labor and the materials are going to cost the same for everybody. So um, the way that that was noticed was that, and you hear a lot after disaster, people saying they're not getting enough money. I'm not getting enough money. I'm not getting enough money. And it's really hard to know. You have to dig to figure out whether that's true or not. So the Loyola Law Clinic started to say, um, well, wait a minute, we are noticing that there are way more people of color saying that they're not getting enough money, that their awards are significantly lower, and we've really got to figure out why. Um, and so that led to a federal lawsuit that proved that the formula that Road Home was using was discriminatory, uh, perhaps not intentionally so, but the result of the program led to a discriminatory result, and that is not legal. Um, and so from there, you know, they filed a lawsuit on behalf of several plaintiffs, and the lawsuit, uh, they, there was a settlement that was made, and the, but those homeowners didn't get any money from that settlement. Um, so, so the people who were already kind of screwed by it were, were just screwed, and you could help going forward, but those people, there were a lot of people who decided not to come back or not to rebuild their homes in New Orleans because they didn't get enough money to rebuild. Now, if you look at the demographics 10 years later, New Orleans is about a 60% black city, 40% white, roughly, with some uh, growing Latino population and a, a sizable Vietnamese population. Um, but it had been about 70-30, about 70% African American. Now, if you want to look for reasons why, why is that? Like, it's one thing to just say, but this lawsuit um, helps us understand, and the Road Home Program structure helps us understand how the demographics of the city were changed by who could come back and who couldn't. So uh, TRO clip three is a little bit of an interview with Kashana Hill, who heads the New Orleans Fair Housing Action Center, and she's talking a little bit about this. And I, it touched on lessons learned and also um, problems in program design. It's certainly fair to say that the discriminatory system for determining the amounts that homeowners would receive to rebuild does play some role in the current racial makeup of the city. The impact is that those people um, would not have the wealth um, and the asset to pass down to their next generation. The asset then becomes interrupted, and so sort of the wealth building becomes interrupted as a result of not being able to rebuild after Hurricane Katrina. It's the good fight to go to court and prove these things, to prove that people were wronged. But what does that do, really? Well, that brings up an important point because um, the government, the federal government, did learn the lesson of the Road Home Program. For instance, after Hurricane Sandy, um, rebuilding grants were not based on the pre-storm values of homes. And so hopefully people who experience these life-changing disasters in other communities will not have to face the same set of circumstances that New Orleanians faced after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and so, you know, that was just a, a great interview that 
that, that lawsuit happened in 2011, but the 10 year anniversary gave us a reason to <laughs> dig back into some of these stories that really were overlooked um, throughout the course of, of post-disaster reporting. So I'm gonna fast forward, uh, we both said that a lot, fast forward, fast forward, zipping around in time. But to, now you really need to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the floods of, of earlier this year in Louisiana, um, it was so fascinating to see the graph on, the, on media coverage and, and public interest. And you know the New York Times public editor basically made this big apology for not covering it more. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, some, on some level, I think disaster journalism is really local. Like, like, the lessons to be learned from disasters in the U.S. are how federal agencies or state agencies are being held accountable or changing policies based on that. But I, I, I thought it was interesting that there was this outcry of a lack of national attention because I don't really know why the nation should care about floods in Baton Rouge, honestly. Like, I don't, I don't really know what um, there are there are oh, there are big reasons for that but like my mom living in Missouri wanted to know who she could give money to right afterwards but in terms of long-term recovery um, I do feel like it there should be more attention paid to helping local journalism organizations cover recovery there's only going to be so much expectation for a national outlet one thing I wanted to bring up was our Louisiana, our listening post, because it's been up here for a while. So one thing we did after this, so this is a project we have where we, via text messaging and um, mobile recording stations, you can scroll down some. Um, there is, we asked, because we didn't necessarily think that there's been a lot of institutional knowledge that has been passed on between Katrina and the floods, certainly some, and we did hear from government agencies like the SBA and FEMA about what they're doing differently now. Um, keep scrolling, should get to, there's health. NOLA flood advice down there. So we asked New Orleanians to give advice to people in Baton Rouge um, who had flooded. And this is just a little, you know, just is very like citizen journalism, community engagement style. Great. What advice would you give people dealing with the Louisiana floods? The advice I would give people is to uh, be patient and uh, try not to overwhelm yourself and take it slowly it's a process do one thing at a time and try not to overwhelm yourself do one thing at a time and use the resources that are being donated you can um, stop it. tell us about the time so that was that was just a sample of that what well, we did about uh, half a dozen of those great thank you um we have about 20 minutes for questions if you could line up at the mic this is being recorded um Irwin took advantage of sitting next to me to say that he has a question for, I don't know whether it's for David or Eve or both. So why don't you do that and the rest well, of you. Okay. Why not? So uh, Eve, uh, first it was very, very interesting what you've been doing. I have uh, two, two uh, questions I want to ask you. The first uh, just came up, which is why, does it, why is this a national story? And it's a national story because Louisiana needs at least $2.8 billion to recover and you don't have it. So unless you plan to manufacture it with taxes just to people in Louisiana, it's not going to happen unless the Congress appropriates. Same thing with the Flint uh, water story and any other major uh, problem that has to happen. It's a role and responsibility of the federal government to stay engaged and respond. That doesn't happen without a lot of pressure, and that's why it's a national story. The other point I wanted to make is I'm making this as a New Yorker who spent a lot of time. We were there with uh, mobile medical units um, within three days after the storm hit, we established permanent programs. We're still in New Orleans and in Baton Rouge and in Mississippi with programs that we established. And so I felt like uh, I had enough reason to be able to say what I'm going to say, which is that I was one of the people that did raise the question about whether New Orleans should not be moved or not. And why is because New Orleans is going to go away soon because of climate change, because of sea level rise, because of coastal erosion, and because of subsidence, meaning that the city of New Orleans is actually sinking into the ground. So in, while we're deliberating how many billions upon billions of dollars we're going to invest there, and by the way, the levees were rebuilt, but only up to a Category 3 storm. Yep. So what they needed was really to rebuild to a Category 5 storm, especially now that we know that because of climate change, storms are going to be much, much more intense. So I think there was a rational reason, not an emotional question, about why are we investing in New Orleans. And to me, one of the roles of journalists would be to help try to explain what those factors were, but there was such a rush to do something um, that, uh, that was not that, to do something that was not really 
mitigated by uh, intense investigative journalism to say, is it worth it to put 20 billion or whatever it is into New Orleans? And there's a legitimate case that maybe we shouldn't have. I, nothing I, personal, but I, no, yeah. nothing personal at all. I, I, I do think that that long-term viability is a great question, and there are local and then national conversations to be had about that. I mean, one interesting thing about covering recovery is the ways in which you represent your community and then also represent the the national interests and in, in whether it continues or not. Um, and yes, the need for national money is great. I guess I didn't think the national media needed to be beating itself up for not covering the Baton Rouge floods more. I, I wasn't personally uh, offended by the coverage that was done or the amount of it. I think it was a kind of a, a politically complex moment. Uh, <laughs> questions from the room. And I would just ask you to keep your questions focused and panelists keep your answers focused since we have less than 20 minutes and several people who want to ask things. Yeah, and, I, and identify yourselves for the sake of video. A student here at Columbia Journalism School. My question is, how can we as journalists engage with communities in the aftermath of disasters as well as years later without exploiting them? Thoughts? Sure, I think that's a great question and important to think about. Um, Long-term commitment is great. One thing that I know Erwin wanted us to talk about was uh, discussions with editors. So you can, if you want to cover a community long-term and its recovery, get a commitment early to do that. And then even as attention wanes, well, you've got this project that you're committed to doing. You're going to check in every three months or every six months or something like that. Um, and so in a way, if you go in with a goal of doing that, you can form that commitment with your subjects. And, and that is really your goal, you know, that I want to keep the spotlight on this. I know that the attention is going to wane in the national media, but we are going to engage in a long-term reporting project together. We, you know, are documenting this long-term, and there's there is a greater good to be had by sharing your story. Uh, and but you have to actually believe that, and you have to actually commit to a process that sees that through. So let me add to that because I'm a pediatrician, and for many years, until relatively recently, I was actually practicing in these programs that we run under something called the Children's Health Fund for decades now. So we deal almost exclusively, basically, with very, very low-income, disadvantaged communities where there's health care for children that's needed. What journalists should know about speaking to families is families who are poor, who live in communities that have had disasters, whether they're acute or chronic disasters of living in poverty, are extraordinarily disempowered to do something about their conditions. And I have found over the years, because we've always done advocacy in, in addition to direct services, is that the engagement with the community is you can actually help do something to change the conditions. It's extraordinarily empowering, and obviously we have to be very careful that we're not exploiting, in my case, the doctor-patient relationship, or in your case, the reporting uh, client relationship or subject relationship. But if it's done right, and if it's done sincerely, like Eve is saying, families are anxious to talk about the situation. They are anxious to say, hey, man, my house is wrecked. I've been waiting 18 months. My kids are not going to school, et cetera, et cetera. They want that message out there. So don't don't assume that there's going to be uh, an exploitative relationship uh, in any way, shape, or form. It's just a question of treating people as equals, being respectful, and engaging them and allowing them to make a decision about whether they want to have some say in their own situations and their own futures. That's what I would say about that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for an amazing presentation. I'm Othia White, a non-practicing attorney. However, I was practicing during Katrina, and I heard no mention of Mayor Fagan. And I wonder if you could bring us up on the position he played and the problems that occurred after and during that storm. Uh, well, Mayor Ray Nagin just lost his appeal on federal corruption charges, so he will be going to jail, I believe, for 10 years is the sentence um, in Texas um, for corruption after Katrina, and that's just a recent happening that he, that he lost his appeal. Now, that said, I think there were a lot more public officials guilty of public corruption who will never be brought to court because once you get Nagin, that's, that's the symbolic thing, and then it's over with. Uh, and, and in a way that is incredibly unfair, but uh, 
because he is by no means the only one. He's not the only one who's, who's been in court either. Um, but so that's the update that I can offer there. And I guess I would just add to that that the whole idea of tracking post-disaster corruption and abuse of authority is at the heart of this project. And when Erwin was talking, when David was talking, when Eve was talking, underneath the surface is this idea of establishing data points and ways of identifying where the money goes, what decisions are being made, who's in the room when it happens. And the Nagan piece of it in New Orleans, a very important piece of New Orleans history from a journalistic standpoint is also a teaching point that there's a lesson to be learned from, from tracking that. So thank you. Thank you. And by the way, the governor of Michigan, along with a lot of his cronies in uh, where Flint, Michigan is, uh, we need a bus to pick them up to take them to the jailhouse <laughs> now. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> nah, I, don't, I hold back. Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Natasha. I'm a student here. My question is principally, but not exclusively for Owen. Um, in regard to those very interesting graphs that you showed us about public interest over time on disaster stories versus media attention, it looked as though the drop-off rate in public interest is quite quick. Um, and it doesn't have very much to do with how much media coverage there is. And I wondered how journalists can address that and also how you justify doing stories six weeks after the event or three months after the event if the rest of the country isn't listening and doesn't care. Well, here's what, here's what I would say about that. That there is this drop, in some of these scenarios we saw a big drop in public interest. There's not a big drop necessarily if the media pays attention and still pays attention among elected officials. They are extremely sensitive to extremely. negative coverage, right? Extremely. Extremely. So, so that, you know, this is a, this is a very interesting question, that sort of a philosophical point you are touching on, because yes, public interest may wane in terms of what's happening to children in Flint, and by the way, the other 1,999 communities that also have lead in the water. But I think it gets into the question of the journalist's responsibility to continue reporting, even if it is not as interesting to the general public because it's uh, societally important. Like I said before, you are the only intermediary between the thing that's happening and the people that are making priority decisions about where money's going to go eventually or who's going to be accountable. So I would, you know, uh, David. You yeah, should. I mean, you're, it's, a, it's a great question because uh, especially in such a fast-paced culture, people tend to uh, view n news through the prism of you know, it's not even the 24-hour news cycle. It's like the, the you know, the 100-tweet cycle or something like that in, in, in terms of just losing interest right away. But that's where news judgment hopefully comes in in terms of having um, uh, news uh, uh, professionals, I guess, uh, just trying to take a longer view of what uh, stories are important and worth covering, uh, even if they are incredibly not sexy and very long-term in nature, I mean, uh, that is, that is, you can look at any number of different, uh, you know, um, uh, big stories, uh, you know, in the last uh, few decades that started out as very mundane uh, things or things that were not particularly interesting, whether it was maybe catalytic converters, I'm guessing, you know, with, uh, you know, in the, in the 70s or whether it was, um, you know, people complaining about concussions in the NFL or, you know, these, these types of things. And, and also, you know, the other thing that a lot of news organizations do is they understand that there's a lot of spin coming from companies or elected officials or uh, or whoever to try to either downplay a story or to make it go away and again it is sort of up to the the sort of the resolve of the of the news organizations to just try to make the best judgment at that time in terms of what should be covered even if it's not particularly popular yeah. and, and Tasha, let me just add to that a little bit as a historical point of view from a historical point of view during, during big disasters, big breaking news stories, to a certain extent, we as journalists follow public interest, or at least we're following big self-evident events. During the periods of recovery and during aftermath and seemingly between big events, we are actually generating public interest. It's we who, through, our, through the kind of creative reporting that Eve and David were describing, are actually putting issues out there and waiting for people to grab them. And you can never tell. It's very hard to know which story, for example, which of David's, which of Eve's stories, is suddenly going to grab attention 
and, and, and force people to wake up and pay attention. Um, you know, Rachel Maddow's little uh, bit of spotlight on the Flint story is one example. That could have been a two-day story, and yet, for all kinds of interesting reasons, it hit when it did, people paid attention, and it is still on the national radar. We can't always tell, but we can say what should the agenda be. And finally, I would also say that to, with a lot of respect for the, the work that Erwin and his colleagues are doing, declining Google searches is not exactly the same thing as declining interest. Mm -hmm. Declining Google searches say people think they know what they need to know. It doesn't mean that they're not ready and receptive to hear something new. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'd like to add just one quick thing to that, which is on, uh, again, the need for local news. Because you saw two weeks after the Baton Rouge floods, of course things dropped off. That was, there was about a week there of a really intense commitment and mea culpas over not covering it more. But we expect that attention to drop off. And that's what I mean in, in, in the shrinking news force that, that David mentioned. That includes local. There are zero reporters in Lafayette to cover this now ongoing. We just got some funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting to cover Baton Rouge and Lafayette. Um, and, and I'm basically volunteering to oversee that project because there's no one there to cover it. And that, that is shocking, even in an era of diminished expectations of local news. There is a there big are some, part of Louisiana. For, for right? my job for radio yeah. so you know this there is demand for information on the local level but not only is there demand there's incredible need for it that's not being met and yes we shouldn't be surprised by declining national attention but that's that's just very different question than the need for local information which is you know a, a bit of a separate discussion uh, hi thank you firstly for the uh, really good presentation uh, I'm from uh, India and I uh, have noticed that uh, India is mostly focused on recovery, not so much on mitigation and preparedness efforts. I don't know how much how 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 much of an emphasis is placed in the states. I'm kind of new here, so um, I, so, and I well uh, I uh, became a firm believer in preparedness when I was doing a design project uh, on uh, disasters and and okay and and I saw uh, that. Some countries, like for example Cuba with their cyclone preparedness, was able to uh, avert huge uh, problems because of, because of their planning beforehand. And uh, so my question really is, um, how as a journalist, and what are the resources available to journalists to understand what preparedness me mm. measures are being undertaken uh, by the government of various uh, agencies and uh, yeah exactly like how does one get to know about these things and then bring them into the conversation great question Erwin? well this is I think it's it really is an excellent question it has to do with you know you a reporter and they'll you know David and Eve will know much more about that you get an assignment sometimes or sometimes you'll generate the story sometimes the editor will say we're going to cover this uh, New York Times reporter named Amanda Amanda Taub wrote an article a week or two ago in the New York Times about which wars are covered in the world. It was a, it's, I, I recommend this, all of you should look at this, because while we're focused on Syria and certain places in the Middle East, there's many other places where, in Africa and Northern Africa and in, uh, you know, Nigeria, where tremendous violence is happening with lots of humanitarian crises, wars, civil wars, et cetera, but a selection has to be made. So the first thing is that, editorially speaking, somebody's gonna say this needs to be covered. And one of the things I've always admired about uh, good journalists, and actually that would have been my second choice if my mother hadn't forced me to go to medical school, but, <laughs> but <clears throat> um, is that a good reporter is able to take, and, this, and David has done this, Eve has done this, take an assignment on something that's very complicated, and in a very short, like an amazingly short amount of time, gets up to speed. It requires study, it doesn't come easy. The easy stories are how you know, Donald Trump was pacing behind Hillary. The harder stories, are what actually were they saying? What are the policy positions? What is the difference between uh, supporting fixing Obamacare versus just eradicating it? Those are hard, and the really good journalists do that. They learn about it. The journalists who have less sort of uh, interest in getting so focused, it's, it's much easier to focus on the staging and, and those kinds of things. So a lot of it depends on the personality, skills, and ambitions of a journalist, but I, but I think 
It is necessary, for example, this question I just brought up before about should New Orleans, uh, should we spend a lot of money in New Orleans or should we not? It involves a tremendous amount of understanding about climate change, about uh, the physical world, et cetera, et cetera. It just, it's, it requires effort. And I, and, I, and I think one of the key takeaways in terms of your very narrow question about how do we cover preparedness is to turn to places like Irwin Center, for example, which uh, on its website and elsewhere will have a lot of background information and access to experts. The Earth Institute, other yes. places. Do you guys, I mean, quickly, because we're short on time, there are a couple other questions, but thinking about preparedness, slightly distinct from recovery, how do you go about reporting on how, and Eve, maybe you particularly, because it's an ongoing story for you. Sure. Well, for instance, uh, the Katrina anniversary this year, we noticed, or, or at the beginning of hurricane season this year, the beginning of hurricane season has become a much bigger news story, I would say, in terms of disaster preparedness. Um, that is a, a bright spot. There are, and whether it's for show, uh, whether it's out of guilt, whether it's out of something, I don't know, but it's, I think, a good thing. It's this day on the calendar, June 1st. There are coverage plans in place, lots of press conferences, things like that. In New Orleans, we have an organization called Evacuteer, which has put up these big sculptures around the city. They look like a person raising their hand. The idea is you can go there to be evacuated uh, in the event of, of a required evacuation. Um, you know, they're in, in the media world, everybody knows about this, everybody in quotes. There's a big public campaign to raise money to get them lit, so they'll be lit at night, you can see them. Uh, our reporter went out and drove around um, with his Uber driver, and his Uber driver had zero idea what these statues were, absolutely none. Um, you know, and I think there are huge swaths of New Orleans that have zero idea what these statues are, but in the media and government, we think everybody knows that story. It's not even a story worth doing because we all know about the evacuateer statues. But actually, the public information is just, just not there. I would say quickly in terms of preparation, um, you know, that's hopefully where, uh, uh, you know, people have made good choices in hiring uh, staff in terms of having a cross-section of, of people who have had different kinds of experiences, uh, are not just, uh, you know, sort of the prototypical, um, you know, Northeast, uh, you know, uh, Ivy educated people who've never been outside of the, you know, the cell a quarter or whatever, uh, but actually have been through, say, natural disasters or have, have a lot of experience. So, for example, you know, um, we ha I have a colleague uh, who, uh, you know, was worked for the Miami Herald, um, actually she and her husband, uh, and they lived through Hurricane Andrew, almost died, uh, and, um, you know, uh, they came back up to New York, but they, th you know, that is a part of their DNA, that's a part of who they are, they've written about it. Uh, I have another colleague who is based in, um, a friend who's based in Phoenix, uh, and, and she wrote about the wildfires there and how it, it killed the greatest number of wild uh, uh, fire uh, fighters in, 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 um, in many years, maybe even history, I can't remember now, but uh, she really uh, knew about it and ultimately wrote a book about it. And that, again, that kind of you know, speaks to just uh, having people who have that kind of expertise that you can lean on, um, which obviously not everybody can do, especially if you have a very thin budget, but you just hope that you have a, enough sort of background or enough diversity among your ranks yeah. to kind of be, fill, in the, fill in the holes and, there. And I'd also add to that, just keep the phrase evidence-based or evidence-informed in your vocabulary so that when you do talk to the, the experts, you can sort of sort out what's someone's best guess versus what there actually is some evidence. Let me suggest, since we have only a few minutes, that the three of you remaining questioners each ask your questions quickly, but all in a row, and then the panel will answer them, okay? So. Thank you. Uh, I have three point, uh, points of tension that I wanted to bring. One, Irving, you talked about uh, lessons learned and then the difficulty in applying uh, the lessons. Of course, we always fight the last war. There's a real difficulty in applying past to, f yes. to present and future, and it's always a huge tension. And the experts are very often past uh, experts of the past. So that's one point of tension. Another is the one shop, the one stop shop. I mean, this idea we know for ages, and somehow governments doesn't get it. Why? Is that territorial? Is that competition among for resources? What the hell is that about? And all and this third, is, well, I have, <laughs> I have too many, but yeah, yeah. the third is 
Uh, the journalist as a healer and a ju the, journal the reporter as, as a guide, which is part of healing. I, I truly believe you do have that possibility. And I believe you have that obligation because you're the ones who give voice to the victims on the one hand and bring the knowledge to the victims mm. on the other. So you're placed in, in the, 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 in a, as a beacon yeah. uh, to do the job. And of course, there are many other. And, 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 and thank you, Yael. And, we, we, exactly. and we'll, we'll explore that as we get the other questions. Thank you. OK. Um, what I hear, what I heard out of this, there are two main issues that come through. One is that these are traumas, and the whole area of trauma and what trauma does and how it works really needs to be explored in a more structural way. And I'll make a few comments on that. But the other one is money. And they are very related in this country. Because this country has been populated to a great extent by people who have come from trauma. And their answers was the gold-plated streets, the money. And money is the answer to trauma. And we are stuck in that dynamic. And that one doesn't work. And we work with. Um, the trauma from the past coming so that these are now magnified. Uh, you talked about our flood in, in uh, North Carolina, but there were 1,000 people killed in Haiti in the same thing, and there are 20,000 in the Middle East, and there are 200,000 in China. But we make such a big deal out of it that Trump's mm -hmm. statement of how he goes is what we as a country do. It's truthful hyperbole. And that's all our news media and so forth. So the psychological setting behind all this and how we don't look at it, and how as in, in trauma there's avoidance, you don't want to deal with it and so forth and get around. And the answer is money that everybody takes in to, to deal with the anxiety of the trauma needs to be, I think, structured through the media so we can see that. And I wonder if you think that's too big a task for <laughs> media to do in the daily thing. Very good, and we'll circle into that somehow. Hi, first of all, thanks for the presentation. And I feel like my question may be somewhat, um, may reflect a bit of what uh, the people before Identify said. yourself, please. Sorry, uh, my name is Samira. I'm a student here and I'm from Bangladesh. Um, and my question is very specifically about last year, right after the Nepal earthquake, um, while the re relief efforts were going on, there was a very kind of a social media protest uh, that there was a hashtag that went viral that says, go home Indian media, because they were very upset with the way the Indian media was covering the relief efforts that were coming in from India, because they felt that they were taking up more space um, uh, as opposed to those people who could come and actually help them there. So as journalists, where do you draw the line between telling the story and taking up space? Uh, here's what I, what I would just, let me direct the answers here, because we really have a hard stop in a couple minutes. These questions all swirl around the role of the journalist in covering recovery. And I would maybe ask first, even David, and then you, Erwin, to say very quickly how you define your role. When you really think about it, what do you see your job as? When it comes to covering recovery, I th think my job as a local news director is to our local audience tracking stand ourselves being served is something we should and taking a career is a very good one is such an important and that there's now a and a data example or uh, to kind of uh, be advocates or certainly not or anything like that. But I think in general, if you sort of apply the basic sort of bedrock principles of shining a light on areas or people that probably wouldn't get that kind of coverage, uh, amplifying concerns uh, and issues that may not get that kind of coverage, uh, and following up and holding people accountable, um, then you're covering, uh, you know, most or 90% or whatever of the different concerns that 
that, that you had. Now, there are also, I feel like, uh, so many more tools available now to be able to tell different kinds of stories, whether it's through audio, whether it's through Snapchat stories, whether it's through Facebook Live, or whether it's you know different kinds of things that give you know more amplification to different kinds of sources. And the, the other thing in terms of, uh, I think you have to be open-minded about how you approach different stories. So, for example, when I think about sort of the healing uh, question, I don't know if it's healing per se, but you know the, the, the project that the paper is probably most associated with after 9-11 is the Portraits of Grief, in which, you know, which was nobody had sort of done uh, these mini bios of, of the people who had, uh, had died um, uh, in, that, in quite that way. And the idea was, uh, for those of you who may not know, is to just do these very brief little snapshots of people who just died in terms of what, they, what their friends or relatives might remember about them. Just a little slice of life, and it was uh, designed maybe to heal, but also to tell a story in a different kind of way. And it's really, I think, resonated ever since as a different kind of way to tell the to to, to not just focus on the important people who died or the the raw stats, but just on little stories that can really, you know, um, um, illuminate the day and the tragedy. I guess. Erwin, last word, quick one. Just very quickly, I think, uh, from my point of view, reporters are storytellers primarily, and secondly. They are the guardians of uh, accountability and truth. And uh, I think we should expect of journalists that they will encompass those three values in the work that they do. And even in things like when Eve was talking about the annual celebration or the, the uh, attention on preparedness, it's the question I raised in one of the slides. Have we done enough since Katrina or 9-11? Uh, have we done far too little and far less than expected? It's only you that will be able to monitor that and make sure the public and the policymakers understand it. All right. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, David Chen and Erwin Rebner and Eve Tro. On the back table, you will find uh, tip sheets from Erwin on his ideas on this. You will also find Dart Center stress balls. You should take them. They are helpful to you. Um, thank you all for being here with covering recovery finding stories in the aftermath of disaster.